Well, I think that, let me see. I will be reading the indictment to the jury. Obviously, uh, count four has been severed. I will be reading to them the counts of murder, criminal attempt murder, assault first degree, tampering with physical evidence. Uh, again, severing count four. And then if we get the penalty, the PFO as to Mr. Greenwell would be uh, proffered by the comment. Yes. No. Okay. It was just severed.
All right. Otis is loaded down. Chart. You got a chart, don't you? Okay. You get a chart, and it's going to be exactly how you see what you're looking toward, and that are these these uh, uh, rows and the stack of jar forms that you have. once you get to the actual juror forms and not the strike sheets, you'll notice that juror number one on the chart is ends in 8318, and that's going to be the first person in your stack. The second person will be at seat two, and on and on. So they're sequential. Does this make sense? Uh, uh, some of you haven't tried in here. Questions on what the chart looks like or how we use it? You, it's good for you? Okay. I just make a lot of assumptions. I just don't want to assume something that's not true. Whenever you're ready, Otis will be ready. Well, see, with your, your new eye, you're seeing more problems, right? Yeah, but I'm going to take my glasses out there just in case. I, I did this without my glasses. Did you really? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, they're getting to look a little fuzzy, a little toward the end. Any questions before he brings this panel in? Not for Tom, No, Judge. I guess not. Thank you. And, and please remain seated while they're brought in. I have to, I have to look at them and get them lined up too. See if they're in a good mood. Okay. 
Front row, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. best row. The rest of them are very tight. So you're in the best row. Be happy. And I don't want to say it when they all come in.
Yes, sir. Last row. Last row. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. There are a lot of you. Uh, thank you uh, and welcome you. I'm Judge Judy McDonald Berkman. I'm one of 13 circuit judges, and I know you're already exhausted. You've been through orientation all day. You've been down here in the mayhem of the courthouse. Uh, but I welcome you, and I really, really appreciate your service. Uh, the case that you're going to hear, uh, I'm going to give you some information. Uh, I'm going to place you all under oath, ask you a couple questions. Um, and then turn it over to the lawyers for Void Iyer, which you learned about today. Uh, but before I do that, if I don't place you under oath now, I'll forget. So if you'd all raise your right hands. To each of you solemnly swear or affirm that the answers you give touching upon your qualifications as prospective jurors will be the truth. So help you God. Okay. Um, this is your first day of this term or tour of duty, I call it, because several of you probably have served on jury duty before. How many of you have ever served on jury duty before? It's amazing, isn't it? Of those of you who have served on jury duty, um, raise your hand if you actually sat on a jury and decided a case. Okay. And of those people, how many of you did that in a criminal case? Uh, not a, an auto accident or a, a, a civil case, but a criminal case. I have one, sir. Where was that here in Jefferson County? Yeah. Uh, what were the charges? Uh, South okay. Um, all right. That's, you know, a lot of you have uh, been on jury duty and never gotten this far or, or never gotten past this far, if that's how you want to look at it. But you did go through orientation and... Uh, this case, you know, could possibly end Friday, but um, I want I, I want to make sure that I have you available uh, two days next week. So let me just give you a little planning here. I I don't keep you past five five thirty ish number one, um, and Monday's a holiday. It's Memorial Day. We, don't, we won't be here. And actually, Tuesday, we won't be here. So if the case goes over, I would need people available Wednesday of next week. So that leads me to the question. 
Does any has anyone here been excused by uh, our chief judge for any part of this week or Wednesday of next week? Ma'am, your number, the last three or four numbers is what? Four, seven, one, six. Yes, ma'am. You were excused when? Of Friday. Of this week? Yes. Well, I guess so, because I don't need you Friday of next week. Uh, so that would be the 25th. Anyone else have anything of major import that's going to distract them? Uh, I'll try to keep you honed in, but... Sir, the last four numbers of your of your badge. Uh, five, two, three, six. Yes, sir. Uh, I've got to be in family court tomorrow, so they excuse that. Uh, I got a doctor's appointment Friday. Well, you're busy. I told you, maybe they just left me till next week. I could get two weeks straight. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, and that just also leads me to, to let you know that I know. And everybody you see in front of you knows how inconvenient, probably scary for some of you, not real comfortable for anybody, and an imposition on you financially, physically. I get all, and I know. And I, that's another reason that I'm so appreciative. Uh, as I've asked you to answer with the last four numbers or three numbers of your badge number, that's how we know you. Um, and, and that's a, not a bad thing. Um, that's how we'll ask if you could answer with those uh, numbers. Um, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to first read you uh, an indictment in this case. So you can probably figure out this is a criminal case. Um, and I'll give you a little more information. I'm going to read the indictment to you. And I'm going to want to know if you recognize anything in that indictment, any names in that indictment. And then I will introduce uh, the people you see in front of you uh, as well. So. The name or the style of the case you're going to hear is the Commonwealth of Kentucky versus uh, Jody Marie Cecil and Brian Lee Greenwell. Mr. Greenwell and Ms. Cecil were indicted by the Jefferson County Grand Jury in August of 2016. Uh, the indictment um, that I'm going to read to you is not evidence against them. It infers no uh, guilt to them. It's the document by which charges are brought up to here in circuit court, all right? Both of the defendants have entered pleas of not guilty. Uh, and in fact, they are both presumed not guilty until and unless the Commonwealth proves to each juror beyond a reasonable doubt that they in fact are guilty. And I know you learned all this in, in your orientation. Uh, and you probably, some of you knew it before. Some of you watch TV and think you might know it, but it, this is no TV. All right, this is not, this is the real world. Uh, so I'm going to read the indictment uh, to you. Count one. That on or about the 13th day of May 2016 in Jefferson County, Kentucky, the above named defendants Jody Marie Cecil and Brian Lee Greenwell committed the offense of murder by intentionally or under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to human life wantonly caused the death of Jennifer Kane. The next count that on or about the 16th day of May, I'm sorry the 13th day of May 2016 in Jefferson County, Kentucky, the above named defendants Jody Marie Cecil and Brian Lee, Lee Greenwell committed the offense of criminal attempt murder by intentionally or under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to human life wantonly attempted to cause the death of Daryl Wilson. Next count that on or about the 13th day of May 2016 in Jefferson County, Kentucky, the above named defendants Jody Marie Cecil and Brian Lee Greenwell committed the offense of assault in the first degree when they intentionally caused serious physical injury to Daryl Wilson by means of a deadly weapon or a dangerous instrument or under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life 
when they wantonly engaged in conduct which created grave risk of death to another and thereby caused serious physical injury to Daryl Wilson. Next count that on or about the 13th day of May 2016 in Jefferson County, Kentucky, the above named defendant, Brian Greenwell, committed the offense of tampering with physical evidence when, believing that an official proceeding may be pending or instituted against him, he destroyed, mutilated, concealed, removed, or altered the physical evidence which he believed was about to be produced or used in such official proceeding with the intent to impair its verity or availability in that official proceeding. Next one, next count, I'm sorry. I think that does me, doesn't it? That's all my counts. Those are the counts against the uh, defendants in this case. And my question to you is, does anyone recognize any of the information I read, the names that I read, the defendants' names, and the, the names of the two, uh, the decedent, Ms. Kane, and uh, the prosecuting witness, Mr. Uh, Wilson. All right. I'm going to introduce the people you see in front of you. If you recognize them, I need to know that you do and how. Um, so, representing the Commonwealth of Kentucky is Assistant Commonwealth Attorney, Mil Mil I always get your name wrong, I think it's Melia Gonjanin. Ms. Gonjanin, will you stand? Does anyone know or recognize Ms. Gonjanin? Also representing the Commonwealth, uh, Assistant <coughs> Commonwealth Attorney Corey Taylor. Does anyone know or recognize Mr. Taylor? To their left, your right is Detective Brian Royce, Louisville Metro Police Department. Does anyone know or recognize Detective Royce? Okay, thank you very much. And then I'll start just to, to your left and <coughs> my right. Uh, the defen defendant, Brian Greenwell. Mr. Greenwell, stand up. Does anyone know or recognize Mr. Greenwell? He's represented by attorney Heather Erskine. Does anyone know Ms. Erskine or recognize her? Also uh, representing him, uh, helping Ms. Erskine is attorney Ryan Dissinger. Does anyone know or recognize Mr. Dissinger? All right, thank you all. Other defendants, Jody Cecil. Ms. Cecil, stand up, please. Does anyone know or recognize Ms. Cecil? She's represented by attorney Brendan McLeod. Does anyone know or recognize Mr. McLeod? All right. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you heard uh, the charges. Let me tell you, because I know some of you are thinking it is not a death penalty case. And I know every time someone hears someone's charged with murder, it's a death penalty case. This is not, okay? If it was, it would be a month long. Uh, but it is not. Again, the, the dates that I really need your, your attention will be this week, again, you're not going to stay till the cows come home um, unless they come home around 5.30, um, 5 or 5.30. Um, and, and Wednesday of next week, I just want that for padding in the event we need it. Does anyone have any questions before I turn it over to the attorneys? I put, um, I, I do put a time limit on the attorneys, so I don't want anyone to think, well, she's getting irritated with him or her, uh, because she told them five minutes. I don't know, that's just because that's what they've got left. It's to help them out know how much time they have left. So uh, with that being said, if anyone, uh, I'm going to let them ask questions, but if anyone doesn't wish to talk about or answer a question um, that you believe is too sensitive in front of everybody, I, I don't have a problem with you coming up, and we can do it here at the bench. You will have the lawyers up here with us, though. So it, it's not quite as confidential as, as you might think. Um, but if you can answer loud. Can everybody hear me? I talk pretty loudly. We do have uh, hearing <laughs> aids, uh, devices uh, assisting over there on the, actually on the jury um, area, if anyone has a problem. All right, with that being said then, uh, Ms. Gonjanin, I will allow you to conduct your voidar. All right, may I please the court? Mm -hmm. All right, good afternoon. So my name is Melia Fonamine, um, as the judge has already introduced me, and nobody here knows me, right? Okay, perfect. Um, so seated with me are Assistant Commonwealth Attorney Corey Taylor and Detective Brian Royce. Nobody knows either one of them. Okay. 
And assistant commonwealth attorney is just a fancy word for a prosecutor. We're called district attorneys in other places. Um, we like to be wordy here in Louisville, so assistant commonwealth attorney just felony prosecutor here um, in Kentucky. So the purpose of this is for us to ask you all questions, and we're going to have to ask you some personal questions, and I know it's a little uncomfortable, so like the judge said, if anybody wants to approach, feel free to do so. We'll discuss it up at the bench, and nobody will know what we're talking about except for your answer to the question that I just asked. <coughs> um, so the purpose of this is to make sure that we select a fair and impartial jury. And initially hearing that, I'm sure you all think, well, I'm fair and impartial, right? Yeah? No? We have a lot of people that aren't fair? <laughs> okay. Um, but what it really means is that we all have our own personal biases. So for example, um, I'm a huge animal lover. Love animals. Um, I am actually the animal cruelty liaison in our office. So if I were selected for jury duty, which unfortunately I would never be selected for jury duty, nobody wants me on their jury, um, I would not be the correct juror for an animal cruelty case because no matter what their defense was, I would think they're terrible people, they did it, I don't, I don't care what you tell me. Does that make sense? So in this case, we just want to make sure that Mr. Greenwell and Ms. Cecil, as well as the Commonwealth, all receive a fair trial. So if you are not the correct juror for this case, that is okay. And I want you all to be honest and upfront with your answers um, because it is okay. There will be plenty of cases in the next two weeks that you can get on and deliberate. So there are no right or wrong answers here. And... Um, the judge has already told you all a little bit about this case, but I want to tell you all a few more details just to make sure that nobody has seen this on the news or that nobody knows anything about this case because we want you all coming into it with zero knowledge at all. So this happened on May 13th of 2016 at 1133 South Shelby Street. Is anybody familiar with that address or the area of Shelby Street? Yes, sir. Your juror number, please. Okay. So the fact that you live around there, with that, do you have any preconceived notions about the area? Not really. Okay. Um, would it sway your decision in this case one way or the other? Okay. Perfect. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Come in the back.
So until the very end, Miss Cecil and Mr. Greenwell are innocent. Can we all agree on that? Okay. And is there anybody here that has a difficulty holding the Commonwealth to its burden? No? No, you really don't. <laughs> um, so we're going to get into some of the personal stuff. Does anybody here hold any deeply held um, moral or religious beliefs about passing judgment on others? Yes, sir. You in the front row. I'm a minister. Okay. Um, what is your juror number? 1065. Um, and you say that you're a minister. Yes. Okay. Tell me a little bit more. So tell me a little bit more about your your beliefs and why it's difficult for you to pass judgment on somebody else. Um, the fact that you believe forgiveness in forgiveness and it's difficult for you to pass judgment, um, this trial is kind of about sitting here and judging two other people. Do you think that would be an issue with you? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. These are the type of answers that we want. It's important for us to know this. Um, so that was perfect. Thank you again. Anybody else? I'm a minister as well. Are you? Um, juror number 8456. Okay, um, same thing. Tell me a little bit more about your um, inability to pass judgment on somebody else. I, I, I won't. I think I do it. I just want to be up front. Now. Oh, okay. But you think that you would not have an issue. Okay. So the fact that you're a minister would not affect your ability to sit on this case. Okay. And it would not affect your ability to make a decision one way or the other. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else on this side? All right, we've got a lot of judgmental people here. <laughs> Anybody else over here? Yes, ma'am. You're in the front row. Uh, 5695. Uh, I'm at a grocery store, and I do see, I've worked there for about 30 years. Okay. I've seen a lot of people. And, you know, some don't know. <coughs>
else that has sat on a criminal jury that we missed? Okay. Um, who here has ever gotten a speeding ticket? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. A couple of you that haven't. I don't know how you do it. Um, so, who here has ever been to a sporting event where police officers are present, kind of directing traffic or flow of people or anything like that? Okay. Um, so, a lot of us have had some interaction with the police. Has anybody had any bad experiences with police officers? A really rude officer during a traffic stop or anything along those lines? Yes, ma'am, you in the back.
since I spent the night in the hospital in Jefferson County on a disorderly charge of two thousand.
Jefferson County, I think, family court. And he, he was, in my opinion, knowing him and the discussions we've had, he was treated very unfairly. Okay. Um, I won't ask about the details, Please but having, having that having that experience, do you come in here with a preconceived thoughts about how this process is going to work? No. Okay. So that experience would not have any effect on your ability to deliberate on this particular case. Okay? All right. We'll go down one. Did you raise your hand? Okay. 6461. I do feel that it seems through the media and whatnot that there isn't that equal balance of the way people are treated based on race. Okay. I don't feel that it would affect my on this case. Okay. Um, all right. Same thing, okay. Um, same, okay. Same as the minister. I've, I've <coughs> dealt with, with my congregation. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I just had 
initially raised my hand, but I have uh, okay. just uh, 911. Um, I just sometimes get uh, caught up in what the press is saying and, and those types of things. So I, I sometimes have trouble showing okay. what's real and what isn't. Okay. Um, let me kind of switch topics a little bit. What would help you discern what's real and what isn't? Well, I guess evidence. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with that, we'll transition into my next topic, which is your old job. What is your old job? To listen to evidence um, and decide the facts. So I'm going to pick on people that haven't talked to me, so raise your hand. Uh, what are the three types of evidence? You man in the back. Yes. Okay, let's talk about physical evidence. What is physical evidence? You sir. Yes. yes. <coughs> Things you can touch. That's correct. And that's what you say to the weapon. Okay. Um, what other kind of evidence do we have? Circumstantial. Circumstantial. What is circumstantial evidence? Can somebody tell me? Yes, sir. Substantial evidence. Who here has children? All right. Sir, how old are your kids? They are two and a half and seven months. Okay. The two and a half year old, does she ever get into some trouble? She does. Okay. Um, does she ever say, Daddy, Daddy, I didn't spill that? She doesn't do that. Okay. She doesn't do that. Okay. Um, well, let me ask. So your wife baked some cookies. Put them on the coffee table in the living room in reach of the two-year-old. You go out there to get cookie. Cookies are gone. You find your two-year-old and she's got crumbs all over her. Who ate the cookies? She ate the cookies. 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 Okay. So circumstantial evidence, right? Circumstantial evidence. Um, all right. Now, we talked a little bit about TV. Who here likes... CSI, Law and Order. Raise your hand. I'm an SVU fan. Okay, okay. Um, who here thinks that CSI, Law and Order, or any of the <coughs> other criminal shows are how the court system actually is? Nobody.
expects to see that in a criminal case? Raise your hand. A lot of you. Okay. Almost everyone. Um, what if there were no such evidence? Would you have any difficulty deciding a case? You may have. Factor three six. I don't know. It's kind of hard to say. Um because I think you can still look at all, everything else and bring it all together, even if you don't have that physical, you know, fingerprint or that. I think I could still look at the other evidence and think, do I really think they did or do I really think they did? Okay. Um, does anyone here know if the law has a preference for one type of evidence over the other two? Does the law prefer scientific physical evidence over, let's say, testimony? It actually does not. Um, the three types are equal, and we can put on, we the Commonwealth, can put on a case with solely testimonial evidence. Solely parading people in here all week and just having them tell you all a story. Does anybody have any trouble with that? I'm not saying that's what we're doing, but would anybody have any trouble with that? No. So you all could just sit here, listen to the witnesses, and decide the case. Can we all agree on that? Okay. All right. Now we need... Who here is a decision maker? Who here is able to make a decision on the spot? Yes? Yes. Okay. All right. Raise your hand. Now, what about the rest of you all? Do you all have trouble making decisions? You, sir. You do? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I turn around and ask me a question. You, sir. Yeah. Do you have trouble making decisions? No. Okay. Um, who in the second row did not raise their hand when I said, who here is a decision maker? Come on, don't be shy. Yes.
regardless of who stole that out there. Okay. Did you walk in here today and the judge read that indictment and did you assume they did it? No. 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 Okay. Um, it's been about 30 minutes since that happened. Have you now, as you listen to me speak, do you think they're guilty, they did it? No, because I'm not really the evidence. Okay. So would you be able to sit here and listen to the evidence and wait until the very end to make a decision? I hope to. <laughs> if I get big. I mean, I can't really say because I am. I'm, uh, okay. I'm really bad about making snap judgments. Okay. Does anybody else feel that way? You have five minutes. Thank you, Judge. Um, now, you also have to listen to the law. And right now, as we sit here, you all don't know what the law on these charges is. The judge is going to give you the law at the end of the trial, and it'll be in the form of elements. So, A, B, C, D. Um, the Commonwealth has to prove the elements under the law. Does everybody understand that? So let's say the elements are A, B, and C, and we prove A and B, what is your verdict? What was that? That is correct, not guilty, because I've not proven all three of them. Now let's say I prove A, B, and C, but you have a question about something that is not in the law, but you're wondering, you're wondering why. And I prove A, B, and C. What is your verdict? Guilty. Who here would have an issue with any unanswered question? Okay. Thank you. Two in the back. Okay. Um, so, the Commonwealth intends and expects to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt that Ms. Cecil and Mr. Greenwell shot and killed. Mr. They shot Mr. Wilson and they killed Ms. Kane. And that it was in no way justified. But if you all had a question about why did this happen, would that bother you? Anybody over here? It would. Okay. All right. Now, your third job as a juror is to decide a penalty. In Kentucky, we have the guilt phase, which is part one of a trial. And then if you all come back with a guilty verdict on any of the charges, we then go into a penalty phase. Um, the penalty range on this case, Judge has already told you all, it's not a death penalty case, but it is 20 to 50 years to life. Does anybody here have any reservations about hearing those numbers? Now, you'll hear some unfavorable evidence about the victims in this case. Um, you'll hear about some drug use. Who here has had any experience with people that have addictions? Okay, a lot of you all. Um, does anybody here think that people with an addiction are not protected under the law? Okay. So we're all equally protected under the law no matter what, correct? Um, you will also hear about an allegation of domestic violence, and this is a touchy subject for a lot of people. Does anybody here have any reservations about sitting on a case that may involve domestic violence between the two victims? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm so sorry to hear that. of innocence, and now that I am concluding my law year, um, does everyone here still agree that as they sit here, Ms. Cecil and Mr. Greenwell are presuming of these charges? Okay. 
Um, and that presumption only goes away once we, the Commonwealth, have proven our case to you beyond a reasonable doubt. And we all agree on that. Okay. All right. I appreciate your honesty and your patience, and I look forward to presenting the evidence in the case to you all. Thank you, Ms. Gondolin. <laughs> Ms. Erskine, on behalf of Mr. Greenwell. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon. Um, I know it's been a long day already. It's going to be a little bit longer. I have to go. Mr. Flat has to go after me. So I appreciate your patience and your attention and your long day. Um, again, my name is Heather Irk and I represent Brian Greenwell. Um, as I think the judge told you, we are going to be contacted a little bit to try and not uh, not go too far and take up too much of your time. So I'm just kind of going to jump right into it and try not to repeat uh, anything that you all just went over. Um, I want to start this, start here. I know the uh, prosecution asked you this a little bit, um, but what all, what all do you think my role is in this case? Does anyone have a, th have a thought about that? <coughs> okay, so um, yeah, so it's, it's, to, it's to defend him, right? I'm a defense attorney, I defend Brian Greenwell. Um, and I can do that right through cross examination or putting on witnesses or, or argument, right? Um, if I sat here and I didn't do anything at all, um, but they didn't prove everything to you, what is your verdict then? Okay. And if they proved that a crime happened and that Mr. Greenwell did it, um, but you had a lot of questions about whether or not he was justified in doing what he did, what is your verdict then? Okay. Does anyone does anyone feel like at that point, they would be convinced he was guilty. Okay. Um, does anyone think it's my job to prove that he didn't do it? Can you raise your hand? Sorry, I can't. I know. Uh, thanks. I'll just start here. If you could say your jury number. You said three people. Sorry, does anyone think it's my job to prove that he did not do it? I said it's not your job. It's your job. Okay. Um, th <laughs> thank you. Did somebody raise their hand back here? Yes, can you just can you just keep up the hands for just a minute, sir? What's your hearing? Okay, and, and um, what is your kind of feeling or response to that? Okay. Does anyone agree with that? Sir, you and your what, five two three six? That's sir. That's sir behind you, five five zero two. Did you, either of you want to add something to that? No? Okay, and ma'am. Judge kind of goes over, but you know, at some point there is a, there is a point for jurors to ask questions if you're seated in the case. If you have a question for me during jury selection? Give it a try. Okay. Uh, does anyone else uh, feel like it's my job to prove that he didn't do it? Is there anyone on this side? Anyone I missed? Okay. Um, and not to belabor the point, but you, you have heard of it in this case. Somebody did die. Okay. And I know sometimes that that changes things for people. I know sometimes it brings up you know, some personal stuff, and you may end up hearing some things that are disturbing, you may end up seeing some photographs that are disturbing. Um, does anyone feel like they just simply could not bear to sit on a jury involved in a case where somebody died? What's your jury number? Okay, and that's just because of your personal experience. Okay, is there anyone else that feels like they just couldn't couldn't sit through this type of case, or because someone died, they, they couldn't give Mr. Greenwell a fair trial. Is there anyone that feels that way? Okay. Um, something you're going to be asked to consider, and you got a little peek of this uh, when they read the indictment, okay, when they read what the charges were, um, and it's, it's not going to be easy, uh, but one of the things you're going to be asked to consider is to try and figure out what you think is going on in someone's head. Okay. And that is not, you know, like I said, not going to be easy for anyone, but it is part of the process of sitting on a jury. It's kind of trying to determine what somebody's intention was. Um, does anyone have any thoughts about how you might try and figure out what someone's intention is? 
Okay, I have a, a hypothetical. Let's feel, let's feel very with me on this, okay? Uh, let's say that we all take a break in just a minute, okay? And you all go outside the courthouse. And let's see, say that you see someone smoking a cigarette. And then the next thing you know, the building is on fire, okay? The, the courthouse is on fire. How do you know, or how do you think you would know, or what would you look for to know whether that person intended to set the building on fire? If you ran away, okay, sure. Anyone else have thoughts about what you might be looking for to figure out if this guy? Okay, so where do you put the cigarette? Did he flick it? Did he drop it? Okay. Someone else said something? Where is what? Where is that? Where is that now? Sure. Okay. Did somebody say his motive? Yeah. Um, so that might tell you, you know, whether he had insurance policy on the building, right? It would be something you would know, think, okay, is this person, what's he trying to get out of lighting the courthouse on fire? Um, so you think maybe if, if somebody had a reason to light the courthouse on fire, that might be relevant, you know, to figuring out what's going on in their head, right? Does, it, does anyone sort of disagree or? Can anyone think of any other thing you would look at to try and figure out what's going on in someone's head? A lot of times body language is a good, you know, you kind of know, you know, people, like, they don't want to look at you or something, it makes you just think, well, or kind of think of a lie or, you know, something like that. Okay, so how they're acting, maybe like right after, um, and maybe, maybe also what somebody says, you know, if they said something about, oh, geez, the building's on fire, what a surprise, right? Yeah. So you might not even know he did set the fire, right? right? Just because. Right. Well, I mean, you know, and part of that is a really simple, simple example of the shirt. I mean, you might be considering whether someone else is involved or what else is going on, what what everybody else is doing, that kind of thing. Right? Does anyone have any additional thoughts about that? I'm learning from uh, how people facial expressions are and how they're looking around from their eyes or just starting to break, break out a little sweat. They're worried about something. Okay, so they're nervous or, um, you know, their demeanor, that kind of thing. Okay, so looking around, seeing if there's any witnesses, that kind of thing. Anyone else have any other ideas? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you another <laughs> another example, okay? Because I'm just trying to um, get you all thinking a little bit about things that are, you know, not not necessarily this case. Um, let's say that over the weekend you got into a car accident, okay? Um, and then you pulled over. What are you thinking and feeling in that moment? Have anyone been in a car accident recently? What's what's sort of the feeling that you have? Uh, well, actually, yesterday. So the high drove plane that's in my car, um, it was not a good thing. I was probably going to make this, but I was probably going to make this. Okay, so upset and maybe yeah. maybe angry. I'm sorry that happened to you. Yeah. Um, anyone else have a thought about that, sir? Uh, the car wreck, not really going to automatically jump the monster thing. I'm going to be like in shock and in surprise. I don't know if you're going to be hurt or Okay, so kind of reacting in the moment, shocked or surprised. Um, if I mischaracterized what anyone said, please stop me or, or um, yes, yes. Concerned that you're really hurt or someone else is hurt. Okay, so concerned, trying to assess the situation. Um, let me add in a few other things um, to make this example a little bit more complicated, okay? Um, let's say that before you have the chance to kind of respond to the moment, the other person in the other car comes out and they come over to your car and they start yelling at you loudly and let's say they're threatening you. Okay, how do you think or how, how do you think you would respond to that or how would you feel in the moment? 
there. Um, some of the same stuff people already said, but maybe more so. Does anyone have another? Defensive. Defensive. Who is, who is that that's a defensive? Did you want to elaborate on that at all? Uh, me, I'm, I'm good to come back. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go ahead myself. Okay, so you kind of bristle maybe a little bit. Yes. Okay, anyone else? I'd be thinking, am I in the wrong here? That would be going through my head initially. Like, why is this person? Yeah, why is this I'll person try there? to assess why I'm in this situation. Is he way out of line? Did I do something wrong in this situation? Uh, that's what would be going through my head. Okay. Anyone else? I know there's some hands over here, sir. I'd probably try to know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Get, get some evidence. All right. Um, anybody else over here, sir? Oh, my first reaction is that. So your response, your your response is sort of trying to de de to de-escalate, right? Okay. Anyone else? All right, I'm going to add a, a few more facts in <laughs> for you. Um, okay, let's say that while this person is yelling at you, or maybe instead of this person yelling at you, let's say that they come at you with their arms up or their fists up. Uh, how many people feel like uh, they would be in danger if that was the case? You're in a car accident, the other person gets out of the car, and maybe they come at you yelling like this. Okay, and, and um, how, how do you think you would respond to that if that was you? You, sir? Defensive. Defensive, and, and what do you think, what actions do you think you might take? Well, I don't know because I would be trying to establish who's at fault before all that started, but I mean, I'm going to go into the defense mode if somebody takes off after me. Uh, okay. to, at least, to at least defend myself until the police get there or whatever. Okay. And this guy just said he feels like um, he, would, he would maybe want to defend himself. Do other people have that reaction? Well, okay. <laughs> Sorry, what was that say? I would definitely defend myself. Okay. And you, ma'am? So maybe kind of closing in, you know? Um, you say. Uh, I used to teach martial arts, so I was, mine started out with top before you all make the go and change yourself to set the situation and try to top them now. Okay, so you watch their body language and other competition and think about how we can go about dealing with the situation. But at the same time, you don't want to go and cause harm to them because there can be a repercussion on yourself. Right. Depending on the situation. Okay. Yeah. I know personally, I, my first instinct when I feel threatened is to try to defuse the situation. You know, I, my first instinct is not to fight back. I'm not a fighter. Okay. Right? You know, no, no pain. So. <laughs> and let me ask you a follow-up. Do you think that if somebody else had a different response to that, do you think it would be unreasonable if somebody's first instinct was to fight back? I think it's unreasonable though. I just think it's just the way people are engineered. Now if somebody was threatening my child, I would be right there. But usually when somebody's threatening me, I try to just like, whoa, 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 you know, let go, hold it up, calm it down, you know, or something to that effect. Or walk away. I try to walk away if I can. Does anyone feel like um, their response to that might actually be to use physical force against this person? Does anyone feel like they might raise their fists back up at them? Does anyone feel like they might do that? It's certainly a possibility. As, as you said, it really is the minute detail of what's going on at that moment. How much of a threat is, is, is this person indeed swinging now? And can I, can I avoid this by simply blocking that away? And, and moving more by and back. Does anyone feel like 
Um, there's never a circumstance where someone where it would be reasonable for somebody to respond with force. Does anyone feel like there's never a circumstance for them personally where they would understand somebody using force against somebody else when they feel threatened? Okay. What about deadly force? Is there anyone that feels like there's not a certain situation in which responding to force with a weapon um, is, is a reasonable situation? Okay, so you'd want to take into account whether somebody else has a weapon. <laughs> Every situation where somebody's coming at you in a harmful way, I always consider I'm going to watch what they're doing, and see if I might know something. I don't know if they got a weapon or something. Because if they pull a weapon out, you want to try to do something where you can protect yourself. But some people are going to have in their minds, even my life or theirs. But if they're doing a self defense situation, I can understand. Okay. Let me ask you this. What if what if that person did not have a weapon? What if they were just coming at you with their fist? Is there anyone that feels like responding with a weapon would be unreasonable? Or, or there's there's never a circumstance in which it would be reasonable to respond to, you know, a physical threat without a weapon with a weapon. I'm sorry. Let me try. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Let me try and reword it. Okay. So let's. I would not think about hesitating if I had a weapon to stop someone from acting. If it's a child, that's a different. It depends on the situation. Or you trying to protect yourself. Okay. Well, let's 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 talk about that. 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 Let's talk about um, so let me let me try and remember that. Um, so you're in this you're in this car accident situation. You're sitting in your car. The other person gets out of their car. They're coming at you with their fists or, or their arms up. Does anyone feel like it would be unreasonable to respond with a weapon in that situation? Are we talking about a gun or a gun or another kind of weapon? Yeah. You do. Okay. That's just me, but I don't. 
And let me ask you this. Do you think if somebody else who was different than you, who did respond that way, do you think that would be unreasonable? Yes, I do. And does anyone feel that way? Same way, sir? You, sir? I'm your nodding. Can you give me your... A lot of people have different, you know what I mean, different, it's a hot topic issue, a lot of people have different responses to that. Does anyone else feel the same way you're nodding your head? I mean, I feel like if someone's just coming at you, then no, you shouldn't, but if someone's beating you or something, then you've got to defend yourself. Okay, so you feel like it's, it's, a, it's maybe a different situation if the person's actually touched you, put force right. on you. So in that situation, do you feel like it's reasonable to respond with a weapon? Yes. Yeah, okay. Does anyone else feel like that's a distinction? I'm sorry, what was that? Why not? Like, you should look at something. Is there a weapon? I'll kind of what you think of as a weapon. Does someone else want to say something? I'm trying to catch everybody. Yes, sir. Well, I mean, I think if it comes to the point, you can easily kill somebody with your fists. So if it comes to a point, where I'm getting the tar to be out of me, then yeah, I'm going to look for whatever's available to defend myself, be a tire on the club or, or whatever. Because I don't know how far that person's going to go to finish the job. So yeah, I think in that case, if he continues to beat you after I can no longer put up a defense, then I'm going to find a way to find out. Does anyone else? I know there was quite a few people that wanted to talk. Is there anyone I missed that wanted to add anything else to that? I think, I think I'm the same way. 44, 44. I, I think I'm the same way. I think it depends on the circumstance, you know, whether you're in fear for your life, you know, as to what you would do. Um, the circumstance itself is going to control all of it, you know, whether you're just going to fight back or whether you think you could, you know. That's just my, my thoughts on it anyway. Right. Hopefully the police will come and help take care we'll of We'll push you in the situation that might matter a little bit too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. But I'm going to defend myself by hiding or apologizing or, you know, getting out of the situation. Sure. Or running, maybe. You know, maybe driving away. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Does anyone else have anything else to add? Okay, so you just, you personally, you, you wouldn't be somebody that would, that would carry a weapon. Right? And that's actually kind of where I was going to go next. So, um, you know, if somebody has something else pressing, <laughs> let me know. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, gun ownership, and, and I know that's a big topic. Um, this case does involve a gun, right? So um, it's something that I want to, you know, brush just a little bit, okay? Um, I know that for some people, they would never have a gun for protection. They just would never have. I'm one of those people I don't want to in my house, okay? But um, my husband, you know, he, he feels like he does want a gun for self-protection, and I win because we have kids and whatever, but um, that's not always the case in everybody's household, right? So um, how, many people, how many people feel like they're just less safe when, when there's a gun around? People feel that way? Okay, quite a few of you. Does anyone want to elaborate on, on that, on how they feel? or? Less safe when there's a gun around. Yes? Okay, and, and there's quite a few people that feel that way as well. Um, does anyone feel like they feel better when they have a, a gun or, or a weapon for self protection? Okay, quite a few of you as well on that. Did anyone want to, want to comment? There's so many of you. <laughs> I'm going to pick you out individually. Does anyone want to comment about that, about why you feel more safe with a weapon versus without one? Yes, sir. I don't think I'd feel either way, but if someone had a weapon, I would hope and think that they would be trained to use it, um, you know, officially. Or I personally don't see you no know, reason why you should have um, that to be trained to protect that weapon. But I don't care. I don't have it in my home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and was there anyone else that wanted to talk to you, sir?
So you, you feel like maybe you might be on the camp of having one but never using it? I mean, like, if someone tried to break in your house and they had a weapon, one of them would have one too. Otherwise, you have already lost. Okay, uh, and you know, let's say, I know I'm, I'm really just talking about owning one in general, but, um, you know, let's say, let's say walking down the street in a, a bad neighborhood, you know, are there people that feel like they'd rather have a gun with them in that situation than not have one? <laughs> or in a car. I was in a car too. Yeah, five minutes, Ms. Erskine. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, and let me just ask you this. Well, um, is, is there anyone who feels real strongly like there's never a circumstance where it's okay to have or to use a gun for self protection? Is there anyone who feels like other people shouldn't have guns for self protection? Yeah. Okay. And is that just personal experience with guns? It's just personal. Is there anyone else that feels that way, that, feels, that agrees with her, feels like people should, should not have guns for self-protection? While I'm on this topic, is there anyone else who wanted to say anything about the gun issue or the car accident? Sarah? Well, I, yes. just, I feel the opposite. I mean, I, I feel safer knowing I have a gun. I have guns in my house that are put away to safe. When access, it's, they're hard to get to because I have kids, I have grandkids. I carry a gun most of the time and pray to God I never have a bullet. But I feel better knowing that I have it if that situation arises. So you might be someone who would who would feel com more comfortable having one than not having one. Absolutely. Does anyone else feel that way? Same way, friend? A couple of nods. Yeah, you sir. Okay. Did Did any of you want to say anything out loud about that? Or all right, <laughs> I've only got five more minutes, so I'm going to move on. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I this is. Kind of a jarring um, transition, I, and I apologize for that, but I just really want to get this up. Is there anyone that's been a victim of a violent crime? And let me just say, if, if you're not comfortable saying that um, out in front of the crowd, we can approach the bench. But is there anyone who's personally been a victim or had close friends or family that have been victims of violent crimes, um, assaults with guns, or, or um, involving weapons? You, ma'am, in the back? Um, and the, is there anything about that situation? Would, would you be thinking about that situation while you were sitting? I don't think it would be changed in this case whatsoever. Okay, so you feel like it was just so long ago that it won't really impact your ability to consider someone else being charged with a violent crime? Yeah, that you wouldn't affect one way or the other. Okay, and I want to make sure I get that one. Did you raise your hand? Two or three years ago, my sister, she was robbed at a point at her store. So she you wouldn't feel comfortable having a gun or you wouldn't feel no, comfortable? No, no. I got a four-year-old, so I really don't feel comfortable. Okay. Do you feel like knowing your sister and having, you know, talked to her through that experience would make it hard for you to sit on a jury involving, um, this isn't a robbery case, but yeah. involving any kind of a, assault or alleged assault? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. Um, is there anyone else raise your hand? You sir in the cloud in the back. Did you raise your hand? <laughs> okay. Uh, is there anyone I missed that's been a victim or been close friends with or family with somebody who's been a victim of a violent crime, an assault, or and I know, I know you already spoke about it, ma'am. I appreciate that. Is there anyone else I missed? I'm sorry, you sir in the cloud right? Is there anyone on this side? 
You, sir. Uh, it's been some time, like 14 years ago. Uh, my wife's best friend was murdered. We had to go through the trial of it uh, in another county. Uh, but, I mean, it's, and it was the murder weapon of the night. It had nothing to do with the gun. But, I mean, it's just something we went through. Do you think sitting on a jury and hearing about somebody who's killed, you know, with the weapon would bring up all those memories? Do you think? Oh, you you think you'd be able to put it aside and kind of independently think about this case? Of course, because it had its own reasons. I don't know what these are, good or bad, but those were their own sense. <coughs> okay. Was it one more? Yes, sir. Do you think you could put those experiences aside to think about someone else's case and think about someone, even with even with somebody who's been hurt? Okay. I'd probably have to sit down. Mm -hmm. Anyone else that has anything to add to that? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Oskin. Mr. <coughs> Mr. McLeod, I know you're last but not least. Your place of court. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Brendan McLeod. Uh, just keep this up a little bit. Sorry. Sorry. I'm the old one up here. Um, Y'all been patient. You'll be excited to know I only take the 30 minutes that I'm allotted. I'm kidding. It won't take that long. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to ask a few questions that were covered, the things that I... Um, anybody here have relatives that are police officers? Okay. Um, Ma'am, can I start with you? Yeah, can... Uh, no, there's one of them. Did you raise your hand? Okay, uh, yeah, do you mind, uh, how are they related to you, who do y'all talk about? I'm sorry? Okay, is he here in L like Louisville? Okay, does he have interesting stories? Is he always believable? Okay, uh, anybody else? Uh, yes, sir. Stepson. Stepson? How's that? LMPD. LMPD? His name or where he works? Like uh, what? Scott Marto. Oh, he's Scott Marto. He's at uh, he's at uh. He's at Audubon. Audubon, Audubon, Audubon Cup, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. And I'm called deceased for Florida. In Hammond. Okay. How was his stories? He never called. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway. Let's see, ma'am. It's just a distant, uh, my husband's second cousin is a police officer. Okay. Um, I don't speak with him. I don't know any stories. I don't. <laughs> Do you believe him more than anyone else? Or? No. Okay. Uh, Ma'am? My ex and my son. Wow. My ex was on a retired LPD, retired police shift. And uh, he was killed in the shooting that happened in Hammond. And uh, he was actively now on the LPD. And what's his name? Okay. Um, now I don't have to ask about your husband because you're divorced. <laughs> but your son, I'm sure you believe everything. Was... Okay. Um, uh, next, ma'am. Just a cousin. He's Indiana State Police, but I don't talk to him. Would he take it, you? Yeah. If I did something wrong, I hope he would. I mean, if I was wrong, yeah, but if it wasn't. You wouldn't say, come on, slightly. No. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, my son's a lieutenant in the police department. Who's that? Brett Patty. Yeah, no, Brett. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah. Do you know what his position is? Uh, I think he's a lieutenant. I don't know. Okay. Um, anybody else? No, I'm just saying. Okay. Um, now, anybody here seen that? Would would they lean towards the account that a police officer would detail versus? A, a layman off the street or a witness that just saw an accident? Yes, sir. I, I, would, I would believe the police officer. Uh, I 
I would tend, I would lean to believe the police officer first. Okay, I mean that would be something that you go into. When when would you change your mind, or when would you? When proven otherwise. Okay. Um, anybody else? I feel like I mean, sorry. I feel like that that's what they're there for. So uh, if they're going to handle the situation, I believe I should believe that for the situation. Sure. So, that's yeah. yeah. That's that makes sense. Uh, anybody? Yes. Yeah, I stay away from like when there's like when their sons and daughters, and you know a lot of those uh, officers that are my friends, they have sons and daughters that are like the Pattersons and all these different people. But uh, when they go to the lieutenant, I I don't see them anymore. They just disappear. They don't they're not in court. I don't, and when they retire, they just disappear. There's nobody. Just, uh, anybody else? Okay. Um, Now, does anybody know what the job is of, like, um, Heather, Erskine, Erskine. And, and my job, I'm, I'm a defense attorney. Anyway, you got the, the magic little quote or whatever. Yeah, that's 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 a good that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, if if they're if they're credible, usually you know, you kind of stay away or whatever it is. But otherwise, I'm in the crawl, usually trying to, you know, get at their game a little bit, uh, to bring them down to, to to hit at the armor, because it is it's very common that, you know, anyone in here would, you know, I would. I mean, if I'm a police officer out there, he's doing this, like moving me, I'm, I'm moving. You know, thanks. Um, but you know, there are certain situations where you know you don't walk into that, and it might be a little bit different. I'm not saying it's here either. I'm just trying to get everyone's, you know, where they where they sit initially. Um, but the um, yeah, the job is to 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 vig like vigorously <coughs> defend the client. And so, I guess what I'm asking is, at the end of the day. Um, if you don't like how I came off at trial, you won't hold it against my client, Jody. I mean, if you think I'm abrasive or I'm a, a guy, God, you know, you wouldn't shut up. Um, you know, can you subcategorize that to me and like not, not you know, lend that to my client at all? And the last thing too, is I've tried a lot of cases. And, uh, when you go in the back, I don't know what happens in the jury room, but when you go back there. You know, I had a lot of juries when they come back, and they come out and they don't have a they don't have a verdict, and some people are crying and some people are angry and they're white knuckling and like I don't know if they're going to go back there and wrestle or something. Um, but I've also had juries where they were split, and I think it became so contentious that one of the sides just ended up each time they became very very much slighter, and pretty soon it was just done, unanimous, and there was no way. I mean, it was just. They were at odds. So what I'm guessing is, can anybody, at, if you're honest, it just doesn't matter. I mean, we'll, we'll take care of it. But uh, if anyone can't go in the back and, and stick, if you, if no one's had, you're going to have conversations in the back. If no one has convinced you otherwise, then you'll stick by what you, what you believe, as opposed to the uncomfortableness that would be there. Because this is a Monday morning quarterback doesn't work here. It really doesn't. And the jury is usually the purview of, of no um, whatever the jury does, no matter how they find it, I mean, it's usually out of the, the purview of any appeals court. So when they come back with odd verdicts, or even verdict sheets get wrong, if they're filled out wrong, um, it's almost impossible to, to approach that. So I just wanted to, because at the end of the day, you might, you might think about something else before you've thoroughly thought through the facts and circumstances. And is everyone here, can y'all tell me, can you say that you would come back and uh, stick by your guns and by your decision, no matter whether it's uh, it, find them guilty and you're the only one left, or not guilty and you're the only one left. You can. Yeah. I, I would probably if it was late. I was tired. I might just go over to the. Switch the flag. Ah, oh. <laughs> there it is. 
we're going home. Okay. Um, well, if y'all can try your best back there, that's all I can ask. So, uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have you take a break now for about 30 minutes, well, until 5. When you come back in at 5, we'll pick the jury, the rest of you will go home, then the jury will go home. So, you'll be leaving here a little bit after that. Now, um, run around, do something not very exciting, but um, don't discuss this case with each other or anyone. Don't talk about it. Talk about something exciting like... I'm not sure what, what there is exciting left after the pregnancy. The Belmont, okay. Um, and then the sheriff will gather you back up. If you'll be back out front at 5, Sheriff Embry will get you, we'll bring you in, and you'll know who the jury is, okay? Any questions before I let you take a break? See you at 5 o'clock. That's 35 minutes. Thank you. You all may have a seat. Thank you. The way I usually, no, the way I always do this is the, the obvious ones I discuss first. And if you don't have an objection to an opponent's motion to strike for cause, just say it so we don't waste time there. I will check these two out, but the two that uh, spoke initially, number seated six, I use seat numbers, uh, says he's excused on the 25th. I'm going to check that out, but any objection to striking him for cause? Huh? Seat number six, I believe, is a female. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Was it? Which one was that? Did y'all write that down? She, she, six, she was, she was, she was excused this Friday. It was her seat number six. Okay, that's it. I got the right number. Okay. Any objection to me striking her? No, Your Honor. All right. And what about number twenty-one? He's got a family court hearing. I'm, I'm gonna have to let him go to that. Apparently, I'm not gonna go beg them to let him off. And then he's got some medical appointment. No objection from the Commonwealth, Your Honor. No objection. Mr. McLeod? No objection. Okay. Seat 6 and seat 21. All right. I have a couple others marked, but I'll let you all bring those up, except for the police officer, number 17. No objection, Your Honor. No objection. No objection. 17. Uh, all right, Ms. Gonjanin. Um, Your Honor, seat number 23, she was the lady whose mother was a victim of a domestic violence murder. She did state that it would be very difficult. In fact, if she could not set that aside, um, I would move to strike Yeah, I, I, I forgot to start. Yeah, her. no objection. Mr. McLeod? No objection. Seat 23, all right. All right, I've got seat number seven, um, the gentleman who is a minister. He did yeah. say that he cannot pass judgment on others. Everybody um, deserves forgiveness. I think this is a criminal matter where judgment must be passed. I would move to strike him for cause. Ms. Erskine? Uh, judge, you know, he said he believed in forgiveness um, and that he saw the good in everybody. Um, I think he said he would have a hard time sitting in judgment. I'm not sure he said he couldn't, so I guess... I guess we would object to that. Mr. McLeod? I don't look here. I just strike him. He, uh, he said it would be an issue, which to me is a little bit of a higher level than... Is it 27? Seven. 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 Oh, it says that I'm going to strike seven for cause. Oh, yeah. Ms. Gonjanin, any other? Your Honor, my last one would be, um, would be seat number 41. Um, he stated a lot of things, but what was concerning to me was um, his criminal history 
and I'm actually not sure that it was disclosed on his questionnaire. It, it was not. I'm looking at it at the moment, and there was no... Yeah, have, number four, have you or a family member been a defendant, a witness, or a complainant in a criminal case? And he did state no. Um, during questioning, did come out that he was charged with a misdemeanor assault. Really? Yes, Your Honor. So we don't have an objection to that. Mr. McLeod? That's awesome. 41 for cause. Your Honor, I believe those are all the cause strikes that I have. All right. Ms. Erskine? Um, just briefly, Judge, for the record, I wanted to put on there that there was a couple other topics I would have gotten to if we had a little bit more time. And I'm not trying to be a pill. I just wanted to put on the record we would have asked um, a little bit more about um, what it means to presume somebody innocent, a little bit more about burden of proof, and I would have tried to get a little bit more out of a couple of individuals. So I just want to put on the record that's what I would have asked. And then as to cause strikes, I just have a few. I have seat number 25. 25 was, um, oh yes, uh, the female who was, this person she said, couldn't, is that the one who would, she's meek, or she, no, she could be persuaded. Tell me your reason. Yes, she, uh, what I have is that she would have a hard time waiting until the end. She uh, would, would make really bad at not making snap judgments. Right, right. Um, I think no I'll objection, have... Your Honor. 25, Mr. McLeod? No objection. Admit, that's uh, 25 struck for cause. Okay, and I think I, I maybe have one more, possibly two. Uh, what is this guy? 19, Judge? 19. Um, I believe when I asked about whether or not I had the burden to prove that uh, Mr. Freeman was innocent, I believe he said he felt that I did, that it was my burden to prove that he that he didn't do it. So we would move to strike him for cause based on the burden. No objection, Your Honor. No objection. 19 for cause. Um, is there anybody else that responded? Oh, I'm going to that question. If you just give me one moment, Chief. I don't think I have any other ones. Mr. McLeod. Uh, maybe 36. Lean, yeah, would lean to believing a police officer. Yes. Ms. Gonjan, any comments? Um, 36. 36. Your Honor, I would, I would object to striking him for cause. Um, I don't think Mr. McLeod elicited enough information in terms of there were no follow-up questions he just stated that he would lean he would initially lean to believing the police officer first because they're there to do a job um, and he thinks that he should believe them but i don't think it rises to the level of a strike for cause he, he also said that if it was proven otherwise so he indicated that he would take into account other facts or evidence to determine uh, the credibility but he said you have to prove and let so otherwise prove it. And he was, he was he, right his up. first words were that he would lean toward believing <laughs> the, uh, the police officer. And then, so there's the bar is already higher for the um, defense. Um, I think he tried to rehab or, or maybe someone tried to rehab him. But I, I, I think uh, just to be cautious, I will strike him for cause uh, for that reason. 36. And I don't know, 47, 48, I couldn't see them. There's two guys back there, and I couldn't distinguish between them. They, they talked every question, whatever one thing. They were just, I couldn't really. Well, denied. You have, you're not giving me any, anything to work with. Yeah, I just, you know, I don't know who they are. They kind of, it's pretty. Any other motions? No, I don't Let me recap for you all by seat number and so that Robert can write them down. Uh, seat, I'm not going in any particular order. Seat 7, 41. Am I right on 41? Yes. Yes. Uh, 19, 17, 23, 25, 36. We also had 6. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And 6 and 21. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine strikes for cause, if I'm not mistaken. That's nice. 27 was not a strike for cause. I thought it was. No. 
No, that was. Seven. I have nine strikes for cause, correct? I also have nine strikes for cause, Your Honor. All right, I'm going to seat. Uh, I'm going. I initially want to seat 14, just because I'm okay. worried over the weekend. Um, now you each have. Uh, Mr. McLeod, Ms. Erskine, you have to get nine together, mm -hmm. and then you each get two individually. Uh, Ms. Gonjanin, you have nine. Yes, Your Honor. So we have some randoms to pick out. So if I'm going to, okay, let me try this again. Minus the nine that we have for cause, minus the 14, minus, minus four. Do I have five? I need, I have five randoms I would be needing to pick out. What you can do. Commonwealth to go into a conference room. Uh, Sheriff, if you'll let them unplug their mics up here, um, I'll show them how to do it. Um, make sure um, we'll probably come knocking at your door about five till if y'all aren't. Yes, Your Honor. But Robert, Mr. Goble needs the sheet so he could do all the <coughs> carving up. <laughs> record and then I'll get out of the courtroom so you can